A quick look at Black Hat. Iran appears to be watching Syrian dissidents, and an Israeli hacktivist breaches an Iranian ISP. Observers continue to track the apparent Russian hacks of at least three U.S. Democratic Party groups. Russia says it's found a sophisticated spyware infestation of its networks, and the news media draw the inference, NSA. WikiLeaks says more Clinton docs are coming. Afraid Gate switches from Cryptex to Locky. Yahoo credentials may be for sale in the black market. ISIS hopes to disrupt the Rio games. Criminals hope to profit. Interpol shuts down a Nigerian scammer. And we pass on advice for staying safe at Black Hat. Time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Silence. Are you looking for something beyond legacy security approaches? If you are, and who isn't, you're probably interested in something that protects you at machine speed and that recognizes malware for what it is, no matter how the bad guys have tweaked the binaries or cloaked their malice in the appearance of innocence. Silence knows malware by its DNA. Their solution scales easily, and it protects your network with minimal updates, less burden on your system resources, and limited impact on your network and your users. Find out how Silence is revolutionizing security with artificial intelligence and machine learning. It may be artificial intelligence, but it's real protection. Visit Silence.com to learn more about the next generation of anti-malware. And even better, if you're at Black Hat this year, swing by booth 1124 and chat with the Silence people. Silence, artificial intelligence, real threat prevention. And we thank Silence for sponsoring our show. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, August 2nd, 2016. Black Hat has completed its training sessions and opens today with the CISO Summit. We'll keep you apprised tomorrow of anything we learn at the conference. The demonstrations, the arsenal, the presentations, and the exhibit hall all go into full swing tomorrow and Thursday. One of the more anticipated demonstrations will be Miller's and Valisec's car hack. They'll be picking on the Jeep Cherokee again, and this time they intend to show what they can do through a compromised CAN bus. There will also be the usual round of product announcements, awards, tips, techniques, and observations. We'll keep you posted. Elsewhere in the world, the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab and researchers at FireEye see signs of Iranian cyber espionage targeting anti-Assad Syrian dissidents, some of them based in Turkey. FireEye calls the activity characteristic of other Iranian operations it's observed. Iran itself has sustained an attack. An Israeli hacker, probably a hacktivist, although it's early to be certain, is said to have breached the Iranian internet service provider Daba. User credentials are reported to have been leaked. The ongoing troubles surrounding U.S. election hacks continue. The Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and the Clinton campaign have all been doxxed, and various security firms continue to regard the culprit as the Russian government. Fidelis and ThreatConnect, both of which have investigated the DCCC hack, say they're convinced Fancy Bear, the GRU, was behind it. The Clinton campaign, addressing their own hack, claims that only a DNC voter analytics program they used was compromised. The campaign's internal systems and email are, they assure the public, still secure. The FBI is investigating. Russia may be positioning itself as an injured party. The FSB has announced that professional spyware has been found on sensitive Russian networks. They teach an object lesson in attribution by declining to say who they think did it, but you don't have to be Philip Marlowe to put two and two together and add them up to USA. The media covering the story haven't been slow to speculate that U.S. security services, NSA being the one inevitably mentioned in dispatches, have compromised some significant Russian networks and perhaps have found their way into the Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear as well. The bears are, respectively, thought to be FSB and GRU operations. For its part, the U.S. mulls how, and indeed whether, to respond to Russia's apparent intrusion into various Democratic Party networks. WikiLeaks' Julian Assange refuses to say where he got the Democratic Party documents he's dumping, but he does say they've got a lot more to dump. They'll be releasing it soon, he says, at their discretion. Some recent court decisions have shaped the data privacy landscape. Later, we'll hear about the implications of one of them, the ruling in Microsoft's favor that enables Redmond to keep data stored in Irish servers away from U.S. law enforcement. In cybercrime news, social engineers are turning to QRL jacking, a newly popular way of compromising accounts, so disclose QR codes with due circumspection. 
The Afraid Gate ransomware operators are still using the Neutrino exploit kit, but appear to be shifting from Cryptex to Locky. Researchers continue their scrutiny of the Ad Golas malvertising campaign, with particular attention given to the means by which its operators cover their tracks. Proofpoint notes that much of Ad Golas stealth and obfuscation has been achieved through steganography, hiding code in images. Peace, the criminal known for selling MySpace and LinkedIn credentials, many of them junk but still a problem and a nuisance, is back on the criminal forum The Real Deal. This time he says he's offering 200 million Yahoo credentials. He says they've been traded privately for some time, but that now they're being offered openly. Peace wants three Bitcoin, about $1,860. Yahoo is investigating. The breach remains unconfirmed. We spoke with Spirant's Samir Dixit about what Spirant is seeing with respect to emerging threat patterns and what you can do to protect yourself. One of the newest patterns that we have actually seen, which uh, was not there, sort of uh, not fully developed last year, was automotive security, uh, SCADA, ICS stuff, and IoT. Places where security so far has been done with obscurity, places like healthcare systems and networks, SCADA, ICS, automotive, like until a year or two ago, like if you go after an automotive uh, uh, vulnerability disclosure, you would be like, uh, companies would lawyer up and shut you down. But now the industry has gotten a little bit more acceptance to, uh, to bug bounty programs and things like that. So you would see more and more uh, uh, come out of that industry in terms of uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities and threats. And then the fourth one is IoT being a new uh, area. Uh, We focus mainly on right now, mainly on making it work. Now that we have uh, kind of reached the state that it has started to work, now people are thinking about like, oh, we built this, but there are security gaps. And uh, that's what these are the four trends where I would see like healthcare, SCADA, ICS automotive and IoT where there would be more need for security going forward and I would see this as a trend. Samir Dixit also has some advice when it comes to password strength. When it comes to password, there is a a big misconception about, okay, I need to make my password complex. But really, uh, when it comes to passwords, it's not really the complexity, it's the size that matters. So making it longer, uh, you're making it tougher to track than and making it more complex uh, with nowadays uh, computing power. That's Samir Dixit from Spirant. The criminal infrastructure in Brazil has ramped up for a wave of theft and fraud surrounding the Olympic Games. Fortinet reports an 83% surge in malicious URLs detected in Brazil. There's also been a rise in test attacks. Sponsors, participants, attendees, and others interested in the Games are warned to be on their guard. Opening ceremonies will be held this Friday evening. There is unfortunately also another threat to the Olympics. Observers tracking ISIS say the terrorist group has increased its use of Portuguese in the inspirational traffic it's currently circulating. The group desires jihadist attacks on the Games. Brazilian authorities and those of other nations are increasing their vigilance. Some good news on cybercrime. Interpol takes down a Nigerian scammer with assistance from Trend Micro and Fortinet. So there will be at least one fewer gang inviting you to share in the oil wealth of a recently deceased and quite fictitious prince. A highly cleared FBI tech has pled guilty to a charge of spying for China. It's good news that he's out of circulation, but bad news that he was in circulation at all. Our stringers are getting some advice on security from Black Hat USA, which notes that it doesn't condone any malicious activity in Vegas or anywhere else. It's common sense stuff, but it's always worth giving common sense a once-over. So remember, don't expect privacy on the internet. Don't open links you get from unknown or untrusted sources. And don't, please don't, take thumb drives from strangers. I mean, you wouldn't take candy, right? Unless maybe they were mints in a bowl of the Acme Cybersecurity Company's booth, but... You know what we mean. Encrypt your traffic, always good advice, and don't connect to any unknown network. Disable Bluetooth and NFC, and don't, don't, don't plug into any random open line jack or cable. Nothing good ever comes of that. Don't leave your devices unattended, and be sure your patches are up to date before you arrive. And bring cash. You use ATMs near the conference at your peril, so don't let your card get skimmed. Oh, and when you leave Las Vegas, let your passwords stay in Vegas. Pick new passwords for everything. Beyond that, enjoy Black Hat.
We're pretty sure our stringers are. Time for a timely message from our sponsors at E8 Security, putting your data together with E8's analytics for security that can handle the unknown unknowns. Consider what might warn you off to malware on your system. Listening or running programs on a rare or never seen before open port is one of them. It's easy to say that, but could you say what counted as rare or never seen before? Or would that information jump out at you as you reviewed logs? If you had time to review your logs, and by the time the logs reached you, the news would be old. But E8's analytical tools recognize and flag the threat at once, enabling you to detect, hunt, and respond. Get the white paper at e8security.com slash DHR and get started. And if you're at Black Hat this week, check out E8's great t-shirt scavenger hunt. The details are on their website. E8 Security, your trusted partner. And we thank E8 for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is Ben Yellen. He's a senior law and policy analyst with the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Ben, a uh, case came through recently about Microsoft winning an appeal. It was a ruling about data searches. What can you tell us about this ruling? So the background of the case is that a federal judge in New York in 2013 issued a warrant uh, for the emails of a suspect that was involved in or alleged to have been involved in drug trafficking. And some of the data that the government sought resided on uh, Microsoft computers located in Ireland. Microsoft fought the order in court, arguing that it shouldn't be forced to comply with a U.S. court order demanding data held in another country. The Justice Department's counter was that because Microsoft is a U.S.-based company, the government can get the data even if it is stored elsewhere. So this became a major high-stakes battle between Silicon Valley and uh, the U.S. law enforcement community, especially uh, piggybacking off some other high-profile cases this year, like the iPhone unlocking case uh, in San Bernardino. So Microsoft won this battle. Uh, in a federal appeals court, they ruled that the government cannot force Microsoft to turn over emails or other personal data uh, stored on computers overseas. I think this case is going to have uh, major ramifications, and it could also influence both where companies like Microsoft store their data in order to protect the privacy of, of communications and who customers use to protect uh, their most personal information. I also think that a key civil liberties victory here is that the court viewed these communications as having greater privacy interests because they contain the content of communications than something like business records or financial records. I think in previous cases, courts have determined that those types of records, transactional records, would be accessible even if they're stored overseas. But because there's a greater privacy interest at stake with the content of communications, uh, there needs to, needs to be more stringent protection. So I think it's, it's a major victory for Microsoft. It's a major victory for, for Silicon Valley and for privacy advocates. Is this a situation where companies like Microsoft or companies like Apple who've expressed an interest in the privacy of their users, they could simply offshore the storage of personal information and, and, and by that matter protect it? I think that would be the most sweeping implication of this case. And I think we'll see what happens once it moves beyond the Second Circuit. If the Second Circuit is affirmed or the Supreme Court refuses to take the case, then I think we're going to see sort of a groundbreaking shift in, in where data is stored. And I think both companies and individuals who have a great interest in protecting their private information are going to look to this case as a precedent and, and start to store some of their most personal information on overseas servers. All right, Ben Yellen, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. A reminder that there's an extended version of my recent interview with Daniel Ennis, former director of NSA's Threat Operations Center and executive director of the University of Maryland Cyber Initiative, on our website, thecyberwire.com. And if you enjoy our show, we hope you'll help spread the word and leave a review and rating on iTunes. It's one of the easiest things you can do to help us grow our audience. The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. The editor is John Petrick. Our social media editor is Jen Iben, and our technical editor is Chris Russell. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.